welcome to another episode in Life's Healing Choices. And if you're just joining us here today, and just a quick review for those who are here for the first time, what we're talking about in this series is about how every single one of us has things in our life that needs healing from God. That we need God to either remove some of the habits that have been enslaving us, or God to heal some of the hurts and the pains and the hang-ups and the things in our past. And in order to, to find that change in our life, we agreed that we can't do the change, but that there are choices that we can and we must make in order for God to do those changes in our life. And the first three choices, as you see up there on the screen, well, first week was the reality choice. And the reality choice said basically that I can't, to admit that I am powerless and I am my own, my tendency is to do evil. Second week, after a very depressing first week of I can't, second week was hope choice, which is that even though I can't, God can, because God is powerful and I believe that God is alive and that he is working in my life and that he wants to change me and God, most important, is on my side, above all else. And then the third week, which was last week, now that I know that I can't and that I know that he can, then the job is to let him, to let him do his job. And that was the commitment choice and to surrender my life and especially those areas that I'm struggling with. I can't, I'm powerless. He can, he's powerful. Let him, let him do his job and get out of his way. Now that the groundwork has been set, today we're going to begin letting him. Now that we agree that we need to let him, today we're going to begin letting him. And that leads us to our fourth choice, which I'm going to go straight in. Is our fourth choice for today is probably the hardest choice of all. And our fourth choice is the house cleaning choice, which says the following. I openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to my spiritual partner or partners. I'm going to explain this sentence in a little bit, but before I do, I know what most of you are thinking. I know what most of you are thinking right now. I didn't sign up for this. Like, I'm here to listen and to kind of evaluate what's going on, and then at the end, you know, I'll see what to do about it. But I didn't sign up for this declaring my faults. I didn't sign up for expressing my weaknesses. It's hard enough to admit it to myself. It's impossible to admit it to God sometimes. Man, no chance I'm admitting it to anyone else. Hard to myself, near impossible to God sometimes. No chance I'm admitting it to anyone else. I'm going to explain what I mean by this sentence. And I'm going to explain what I mean by admitting your faults to your spiritual partner and how that ties in with the sacrament of confession and your father. I'm going to to explain all that in a second. But the first thing that we need to understand at the beginning is we said in the beginning the goal of this series is to find freedom. Remember that? We said we want to be free. We talked about the chains. We want the chains to go. The things that have shackled us, we want to free. We want to soar. I didn't put the verse up on the screen, but the famous verse. The Lord says, if you want to be free... You have to know what? You shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. That's John 8, 32. I didn't put it up there. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Here's what I'm trying to say. Truth and freedom are linked. Truth is the price you must pay for freedom. Or the flip side, freedom is the reward for truth. But you will never find freedom unless you learn to find honesty and truth. The rest of the time, I'm going to focus on the truth side. But let's just for like one minute, kind of set our sights on the freedom side. I say the word freedom. I say the word relief. I say the word clear conscience, no guilt, no shame. Can you breathe it in with me? Can you? I can smell it. Wouldn't it be great? All the guilt all the shame all the stuff that I spend day and night trying to hide and avoid wouldn't it be great that I'm free 
I never jumped out of a plane. I don't ever expect that I will. But the feeling of being in the air, free fall, seems pretty cool. And those who have done it sound, tell me that it, it's a pretty cool thing. And I can imagine that if I could sign up for just the free fall without the jumping or the landing, okay, I'd probably do it. But you can't. You can't have just this without the jumping. And that's what I'm talking about here today, is that God wants to give us that free feeling, guilt-free, shame-free, clear conscience, nothing weighing. But you have to jump out of a plane. And no one wants to jump out of a plane. And it's scary to jump out of a plane. And you know what's land on the other side of jumping out of a plane? But today, we're going to jump out of a plane. I shouldn't say today. This week, we're going to jump out of a plane. And it's going to be scary. And it's going to be hard. But man, oh man, it's going to be worth it. When we're free falling, free falling down there like that. I guarantee you right off the bat, just like anyone who would be up on a plane, guarantee you, no matter how you feel right now, standing at the door of the thing with it open, fear is going to come. And 100% the enemy is going to fill your mind and your heart with fear this week. You're going to have a thousand, ten thousand excuses as to why you shouldn't be open and honest, why you shouldn't examine yourself, why you shouldn't confess. There's a million reasons, and the enemy is going to fill you, and every single one of those reasons has the same root cause. It's fear. It's fear. He's going to fill your hearts with fear about what people are going to say, about what God's going to say. Fear. But we know that there is no fear in love, that perfect love casts out fear. And all of these fears are based on a misunderstanding or a false thing, a false idea, a myth about something. So what we're going to see here today is some truths that when you open that can of worms, what's going to happen? And when you jump out that plane, what's going to happen? Our beatitude for today is Matthew chapter 5, verse 8 that says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Period. I want to see God. You want to see God. The Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart. Two truths that this teaches us right off the bat. The first truth is that God doesn't want me to be perfect. He wants me to be pure. What I mean by that is, is that I'm thankful that it doesn't say, Blessed are the perfect in heart, for they will see God. It does not say that. It does not say, Blessed are the perfect, as sometimes we think it is. And we think, because I'm not perfect, I can never achieve this freedom, or I can never see God. Bible doesn't say, be blessed are the perfect. It says, blessed are the pure. In John chapter 11 is a story of Lazarus when Christ raised him from the dead. You can learn a lot about what Christ wants to do in your life by seeing what he did in the life of Lazarus. John chapter 11, verse 43 and 44. Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. What's interesting about what happens here with Lazarus? You ever think about it? What did Christ do for the guy? Christ raised him from the dead after he had been dead four days, and he stank, and he was smelly, and he was hopeless, and Christ gave him new life. How hard was it, like, in a human perspective, like, as far as, like, my abilities, to give Lazarus life, one to ten, difficulty, scale of one to ten, ten being the hardest. Ten, ten okay, easily ten. This is an easy one, okay? This is very difficult, no one can do it. But what didn't Christ do? What did not Christ do? He had grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. One to ten. How hard would it have been to unwrap the thing around his mouth? One to ten. The grave clothes. The mummy stuff. You know the mummy stuff. One to ten. How hard would it have been? Why he did the ten, and he leaves the one? Why he did the ten, and leaves the one? 
first thing that it shows us is that you can be given new life and still be bound. You can be given new life. You can be a new person. You can have the life in Christ and still be bound. And that's our experience. Don't tell me I was baptized. Don't tell me that I, I made a repentance. Don't tell me any of that stuff. You can be given new life by Christ, by His hand, by His voice, and still be bound and in need of freedom. Do you understand what I'm saying? That just because... Let me put it this way. Just because you have life doesn't mean that you're living. Just because you have life doesn't mean that you're living. And Jesus didn't come just to give us life. He came to give us fullness of life. That's what he says in John chapter 10, verse 10. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Not just have life, but have life more abundantly. And there's many of us that have been given life, but are still walking around with the things and the things. With the grave clothes and with the thing around our head. The grave clothes are killing you? No, they're not killing you. But what they're doing is, they're keeping you from living the fullness of life. And that's what I'm talking about in this series. You can live the rest of your life with your hurts, with your habits, all that stuff. God will forgive you. Yes, He'll forgive you. I'm not talking about forgiveness. I'm talking about living the fullness of what God has planned for your life. And there's many people, unfortunately, that are living sub fullness even though they've been given life by Christ so here's my question for you what's binding you what is keeping you from living the fullness of life what's restricting you what's holding you back from the life that Christ says that you would have life and life more abundantly what's holding you back from that abundant life that's what we're talking about here in this series the second lesson that we learned about these grave clothes is how does God want to remove these grave clothes? The truth is that God brings about our freedom through people. I told you guys this before, and I'll say it again. I don't make the rules. I just tell the rules. And I abide by the rules. I wish that freedom, like I said before, was not by people. I wish it was by TV and ice cream. I wish it was, it, was, it was by relaxing and sleeping as much as you can. And I wish that brought freedom. But that ain't reality. And if that's the way that you want to live your life, and you want to convince yourself that just being isolated from people is going to give you freedom, you're living a sucker life. God made the rules, and He said that freedom comes through people. Look, I raised Lazarus from the dead. You think it would have been hard for me to unwrap the thing around his mouth? But that's not the way that I choose to do things. That's what he said. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Jesus said to them, he insisted that Lazarus would be freed by them. Who's them? Who is them? Who's your them? Them for Lazarus was the disciples. The followers of Christ. The church. Jesus does his greatest miracles through people, through his body, through the group, which is known as today is the church. The disciples, okay, were like, who are the disciples today? Is the church. Okay, the fathers of the church and the body of the believers, the followers of Christ today. And that's why sometimes people come to me and say, I'm close to God, but church, eh, small group, eh. Look, I'm not saying you can't go to heaven unless you attend a small group. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not saying you can't go to heaven unless you come to church. I'm not saying that. Um, you can be very close to God and never attend a Bible study. You can be very close to God and never attend. That's fine. But you are not going to have the fullness of life unless the body of Christ and the believers in the body of Christ are an integral part of your life. What every single one of us needs 
Okay, y'all heard of the movie? It was six degrees of something, but I can't remember what it was. Separation, I want to say, right? Okay, I don't know what that movie was about, but I don't believe in six degrees of separation. I believe in 360 degrees of relation. 360 degrees of relation. That God made us to need 360 degrees of relationships. We need people above us, people peers to us, people below us. This is the fullness of life. We need fathers. We need brothers. We need sons. We need spiritual fathers. We need to confess. When I talk about confession a little bit, no doubt the spiritual father, the father of confession, integral. And for those who are not members of our church, one of the things that is integral in the Coptic Orthodox Church is the sacrament, the two sacraments of confession and the sacrament of communion. And the two go hand in hand and you can't have one without the other. And you are never going to be living the fullness of life without each of these sacraments. Never. But here's what I'm trying to say. Is that just having a spiritual father isn't enough. You need spiritual brothers too. You need people who's going to hold you accountable. Look, let's be practical. Every now and then I run into the theoretical sacrament Nazi guy who says, no, the father of confession, that's it, and that's all we need, and we don't need anyone else just the father of confession. And he'll follow up with us. Look, I'm a father of confession, okay? I love you all. I love you all, and I love all those who confess. I love all my spiritual children. If you're relying on me to hold you accountable, good luck to you. You're fooling yourself. You confess once every three months, four months, six months. How many people is in this church? This church, on an average Sunday, has about a thousand people that come through the doors. A thousand people. There's three of us priests. That's 333 people per person. You really think I'm keeping up with 333 people? That I know of 333 people is praying? That I know of 333 people is doing their quiet time? That I know of 333 people is doing all the stuff that they say they want to do? Come on. Let's be realistic. The spiritual father is very important, but we need spiritual brothers. And we can't have this, this thing, this, what's it, a taboo thing, okay? Of, of, we already discussed that. We're all in the same boat. You're a horrible person, I'm a horrible person. So why don't we just admit we're horrible people together and stop trying to pretend we're something that we're not? There's no shame. We need to find spiritual brothers. And that's hopefully where small group can help you. If you're married, marriage is a great place to go for spiritual partnership. And one of the things that, like, pains me is to see a spouse with another spouse that can't reveal and open and, and confess stuff. Trust me, you're hurting your marriage and you're hurting yourself. God gave you that person to help hold you spiritually accountable to you to hold them and them to hold you spiritually accountable. Recently, I've been making a very active effort to have Marianne, my wife, be my accountability and tell her everything. And husbands, you know it's dangerous to tell your wives everything, okay? And there is, that's the, that's the jumping out of the plane thing, okay? Is, is, is telling them everything. But I'm telling you, best thing that ever happened in our marriage, best thing that happened for our closeness, and I gotta be honest, best thing that ever happened in my spiritual life is when I opened and I got rid of this idea that I gotta be something that I'm not. We need spiritual brothers. And then of course, we need spiritual sons as well. Which means that we should not just be receiving from God, but we should help guide others, and hopefully we can be fathers and older brothers to people at some point in time. God does freedom through people. Now, let's take a step back. <clears throat> What's the connection between this talk I'm saying about confession and pure in heart. What's the link between the two? And, in addition, how can I be really pure in heart? If I look at my life, I don't even look, I don't even need to look back more than one week. I don't even need to look back more than one day. And just as, as we heard in the sermon today, okay, um, we heard about judging in the sermon today, that if we're honest, 
in, in the last two hours. I don't need to look very far to see I'm not pure in heart. I'm not. My heart's not pure. My eyes aren't pure. My thoughts aren't pure. My hands aren't pure. My feet aren't pure. And then you come to me and say, okay, God doesn't need perfect, but He needs pure in heart. How can I be pure in heart when I see so much impurity inside? First thing we realize, is, as with everything else, is that this job of purifying the heart is a lot more Him and a lot less me than I think. Okay? It's more Him and less me. I have a part, and we'll talk about my part. But let's not negate the fact that 99.99% of grant me a pure heart is Him, not me. Said another way, being good doesn't purify your heart. Purifying your heart makes you behave good. See that one? Being good, behaving good, which is how we usually think of, I gotta be pure, I gotta behave, I gotta behave so I can be pure. It's not that if you behave good, you become pure. It's the opposite. It starts with God, ends with us. It's that when God makes us pure, then we can behave good. So right off the bat, God takes a lot of pressure off us and says it's not your job to be good. You can't be good. And I'm not expecting you to be good. That's why the Bible says, Romans 5, 8, He demonstrates His love for me and that while I was still a sinner, He died for me. He didn't wait for me to be good. He died for me so that I could be good. So we don't confess to make us pure. We ask God to make us pure so we can live a life of repentance, live a life of confession. It starts with Him, not with me. Is this good news or bad news? Do you like this or don't like this? Do you like the fact that you don't have to do much to be pure? And do you like the fact that it's just God's thing to make you pure? You hate it. You hate it and I hate it. This past week in, in our small group, we had a, a wonderful discussion. And the guys in the group, especially, <clears throat> Bible said, we're talking about the verse that says, come to me and I will give you rest. And we're talking about finding relief. I'm sure you all have the same small group discussion. And we're saying that all he's asking us to do is come to him. And the girls, they love that. We guys, we hated it. We wanted it to say, give me something tangible. Give me something concrete. Tell me, pray for three hours, and then you'll find rest. And I say, great. Tell me to read this much in the Bible. Shoot, tell me to run around the church cackling like a chicken. Fine, just tell me to do something. Give me something I can do so that I can control it. God says, no. You don't got to do anything. Just come to me. We hate this. We would much rather a to-do item so that I don't have to deal with stuff. God says, no, you don't got to do anything. But you do got to be honest. And you do got to examine. And you got to confess. You don't got to do anything. I'm not saying you got to fix it. But you got to examine it. You got to confess it. Watch this verse right here. When you do that, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Listen carefully to this verse. If anyone is in Christ, he is, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You study the verb tenses in there, and what you will see is that what this verse is telling us is that he's talking about something that is right now. When you purify your heart, when you examine, when you confess, you know what happens? If you ask God, this boy, this foolish boy right here, who's standing up on this stage, who's got all kinds of bad stuff, and his behavior is really bad, and you should see his thoughts, and you should see the stuff going on inside him. This boy, what do you see in this boy? Jesus would say, new creation. I see a pure heart. No, you don't see this and this and that? The Bible says, no, no, no. That's not what I see. I see a pure heart. I see that there was some old stuff, but he dealt with it. He got rid of it. Even if I didn't get rid of it, even if I'm going to do it again tonight, I 
get in, get rid of it. But he sees that as, no, no, those are the old things. Those have gone away. How? Because you purified your heart. And if you purify your heart, God sees you in a new light. Here's what I'm trying to say. You think that being pure in heart means stopping A, B, C, D and all these other things. Let me tell you a little secret. Don't tell anyone because it's just between me and you. You're never going to stop those things. Just between me and you. Don't tell anyone. You keep letting them think whatever. The truth is, let's take one example. Let's take something like, again, the sermon today was about judging and judgmental thoughts. Tell me the human being who can check off on his list, I don't judge anymore. This was a problem in the past. I haven't dealt with it. I don't deal with it anymore. I don't judge. Find me the person who can walk around and say, lust, no problem with lust. No, no, no. Oh, I don't even notice. No, no, no. I don't notice those things. Find me the person. Find me the person who isn't critical. Find me a person who doesn't struggle to keep his patience. Find me a person who never loses his temper. Find me that person. You think you're going to become that person? Man, you're never going to become that person. That's not what it means to be pure in heart. That's not what it means to be pure in heart. Good behavior doesn't make you pure. Being pure makes your behavior good. And what we need to learn how to do is to get to the court, to get to the heart, and make this purity process, and we'll see how it's a process in a little bit, go underway. The basis for a pure heart is not how good you've been, but rather how good God is. The basis of the purity of your heart is not how good you've been, but how good God is. There's a very nice song on the radio that says something to the effect of, says, um, I, sorry, you are who you are no matter who I am. Is that right? Something like that. And then there's another one that says something similar which says, not because of who I am, but because of who you are. Something like that. Okay? Here's the point, people. Is that the purity of heart thing is a lot more him and his goodness than it is my actions. I showed you a minute ago this picture. I'm going to tell you a story about this picture. This picture, if you go on my desktop at home, you find this picture. And don't tell any of them. Okay? But this replaced the picture of my kids. Okay? My kids used to be on my desktop, but I found this picture. Don't tell them, okay? Don't tell them. And the reason why, this is my favorite picture in the world. The story of this picture is a picture I took with my camera phone back this summer, maybe in like June or July or August. I was in a place called Calgary, okay? Calgary is a place very, very, very far away, okay? It's up in Canada on the west side, so like the Rocky Mountains. Okay? So like above Montana or something like that. I was at this convention, okay, and they invited me to this convention for the youth and whatever. And usually when I go to these things, you know, they, they stick you in some crummy dorm room with some smelly kids and, and, and it, it's one of these things. I get to this place and man, this place is the nicest place I ever stayed in my life. It's so nice, they don't even call it a hotel. You know what they call it when you're big time? A chateau. Yeah, watch that one. I stayed in my very own chateau. And I'm in this place, and I'm inside, and there are like 10 guys grabbing my bags. And first, I didn't want them to grab my bags, and I realized they were trying to help me, so I let them carry my bags. Get to the room, and there's a big flat screen TV in the bathroom. In the bathroom. You're sitting there. And you could take, make an experience out of the whole situation. All kinds of soaps and shampoos and all kinds of stuff. And the nicest place I've ever been in my life. And I'm going up and down the elevator like a little boy, playing with all the different stuff and all the different amenities. And this place is the nicest place. Then the next morning I wake up. I wake up early in the morning, before, even before most of the group was awake, before the sun had just started to come up. I went outside. I, I had arrived there in the evening, so I didn't really get to see the place. So I went to like the 
the front desk and I said, I had my Bible with me. I said, is there like a quiet place, a scenic place that I can go and just, you know, do some quiet time? So the guy like chuckled he, as if like I'm an alien from the moon, okay? And he's like, yeah, just go out these doors. I'm the only idiot in the world. I walk out these doors and I find myself in front of this huge lake, which honestly the water was crystal. I look up and it's the tallest stinking mountain I've ever seen in my life, which must have been a hundred stories high as far as a thousand stories high. As far as I was concerned, it went up and, and, and God was sitting right on the top of it. And I was just in awe and amazement. We had some free time later in the day, and I asked the group if we could do some hiking and go as far up as, as, far up as we could go. This is as far as they would let us go, and I took this picture. You see this picture? You see there at the bottom, there's our chateau. <clears throat> and then you see this mountain above it? Every time I look at this, the mountain looks unreal, doesn't it? It almost looks like a cartoon. It looks like someone just copied and pasted it in there. It doesn't look real. Why I took this picture and why I keep this picture in front of me is it helps me to keep in mind the difference between me and God. This is the difference between me and God. I'm down there that first night and I'm all over the place in the chateau and I'm playing with this and this is the coolest place. And look at, I was on like, I had like 18 floors, I was on the 17th. And look how high this place is. People, from this angle that we're standing out here. Anyone look at that picture and say, wow, what a big chateau that is. And even look at it and say, wow, look about how nice that hotel, anyone look at this and see the hotel? Man, you can barely see it. And if I didn't tell you, you'd tell me this is like two or three stories. You couldn't tell this is an 18-story thing with nice stuff all around it. This is God and me. You know what I especially like about it? As I'm walking through the chateau, I'm a critical person. I just told you that a minute ago. Okay? I'm a judgmental, critical person. Just like Mark was talking about, I'm number one. So even though I see all these nice things, it's my gift in life to find the things that are broken and to see, eh, it's not, something not right there. And this chateau, even though it was excellent, wasn't perfect. It had some blemishes. Can you see any of them? Can you see the window that's broken? Can you see the oil stain in the parking lot? Can you see it, anyone? Can you see the wall that needed to be painted? Can anyone see it? The doorknob that was loose. Can you see it? Here's the thing, people, is that this chateau was far from perfect. Far from perfect. But in light of the big mountain, who cares? This is the way I want to live my life. That's why I have this picture. Is that any time I start to think of myself positive or negative, positive or negative, as being too high, I just take a step back and see how big God is. And I say, you know what? It's okay that I got some blemishes. It'll be okay. He's big enough he can cover it. It's not the end of the world as sometimes I think it is. Or, as I have written in my journal, my badness can't touch his goodness. My badness can't touch his goodness. My question for you is, Get away from the behaviors. Leave that aside. We're going to deal with those at another time. I want to go to your heart. And I want to go inside to your heart. And I want to ask you, what's inside your heart? Your actions may not be pure. But is your heart pure? God is looking, not for people who are perfect in action but people who are pure in heart, who say, God, I have all these weaknesses, and God, I want to give them all to you, and I want you to purify me, and I want you to cleanse me, and I'm willing to do anything to get rid of it. And I know I won't, and I know I'm going to try and fail, and try and fail, and try and fail, but I'm never going to stop trying, because I trust that you, the big mountain, your goodness, can cover my badness. That's the heart that God is looking for. Don't let your actions talk smack to you. Don't let your actions like bully you and say, no, you can't be accepted. And no, you're bad. Look at your actions. Man, don't let your actions 
talk bad to you. God doesn't care about actions. He cares about heart. Want to see one of the nicest verses in the Bible? I'll show you one of the nicest verses in the Bible. And if you keep this verse, the devil can't touch you if you keep this verse close to your heart. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Not those who don't use bad language. Not those whose eyes never looked at a bad thing. Not those who never lost their temper. Not those who are perfect in action. But those whose heart is loyal. And those whose heart is say, I want to be pure. I want to live this life that you want me to live. And I know I got problems, but I admit it, I confess it, and I'm not hiding it. The Lord loves to show himself strong on behalf of those people. You do that, and I guarantee you, God will show himself in a way that you've never seen him in your life. St. Paul speaking. He's speaking about Abraham in this passage and about how God... <coughs> he's speaking in this passage about how God sometimes sees things not exactly as they are. And he's speaking about Abraham and how God, when Abraham had no children, called him a father. Look what it says. Romans 4.17 The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. He calls things that are not as though they were. God looked at Abraham and he called him, you're a father. You're a father. And this was the one expression that the entire universe, everyone would say anything about Abraham, but no one would ever call him a father. Because this is the one thing that he's not. And he was a failure at this. And anything else, call him a good guy, call him a jerk, call him whatever. But you can't call him a father. God said he's a father. How? This is the eyes of God. They see things that are not, or things that are not as though they were. If you're an architect, if you're like an interior designer, engineer, whatever, I don't have this gift. Some people have it. You can walk into a room and it's full of mess and they see, no, this is, you know, very... You know, this can be something nice, okay? You know what I mean? Like, someone can walk into a, a shack and see what it will become when they repaint the walls and replaster the this and put whatever, okay? I'm not good with this stuff. But some people have that gift. And they can walk. That's how God is. God walks in and we see mess, things broken, things leaking. And God sees no, strong, pure. You know Michelangelo, the great artist guy, who sculpted the statue, famous statue called David, okay? It started off as one huge block, okay? And it ended up as this great masterpiece called David. Michelangelo said the following. They asked him, like, how he did it. He said, simple. I looked at the block, and I cut away anything that wasn't David. That's God. God sees me and sees mess. Oh, I'm sorry, there is mess. But God sees through it and sees me and he just starts chopping away. And we want him to chop faster. Hey, I see the masterpiece. I see that he's just chopping away, sculpting, sculpting, sculpting until we get to the masterpiece in the end. It's a process. It's not an overnight thing. 99% of the process is him. But there is 1% that's me. And I'm going to talk about the 1% right now, but believe me, I was very hesitant to doing this. I was thinking just end it right here because I'm so worried that I'm going to say our part is this and that's all we're going to remember is A, B, C, and D. And I'm telling you, A, B, C, and D is worthless if it wasn't for him doing the other 99%. So please, don't take what I'm saying and leave with a formula to a pure light. Don't do that. Because it's not how it goes. But there are some things that we can do based on his goodness. That's the key. Is based on his goodness, I will. So I don't want anyone to leave here and say, I will. I want everyone to say, based on his goodness, I will. Okay? 
based on the mountain being this big, I will do this with my little hotel. First thing I will do is I will not hide. Based on his goodness, I will not hide. What do we usually do when we mess up? What do we always do when we mess up? Same thing Adam did, same thing Eve did, same thing I do, same thing you do. We hide. We run away. We run from God. We run from others. We feel guilt. We feel shame. I can't read my Bible. Why? Guilt. I, I, I don't know if I'm going to go to church. I just, I, I need time to myself. Small group. Uh, I, I just need to be alone. We hide. We run. Who wants you to be alone? Who wants you to be alone and isolated? I'll give you a hint. It's not your friend. It's your enemy. You heard of divide and conquer? Man, if he can divide us, he can conquer us. If he can keep you isolated, you like taking candy from a baby. We think, I can't read my Bible, I can't go to church, I can't pray, because that would be hypo hypocritical of me. I would be a hypocrite, because I'm doing bad, so I have to fix my bad, so I'm not being a hypocrite. That's not hypocrisy. That's reality, is that you're bad. Hypocrisy is in fact the opposite, is pretending that you're not bad. <clears throat> we will not hide our sin. Especially, we will not hide it from the one, the only one who has the power to kill it. If you have sin, you need a savior. And the only way that you can be freed from your sin and given salvation is through a savior. What I'm saying is, we think I have sin, can't go to God. God is saying, hello, my only purpose of my existence is to kill sin. We think I have sin. This is exactly like saying, I have too many bugs to call the exterminator. I'm too sick to call the doctor. My house is too dirty to call the cleaning people. This is what you're saying. Doesn't make any sense. His specialty is to deal with and remove and fix sin. So the more that sin, I'm not going to hide from God, I'm going to run towards God. That's what the Bible says, is that He's the solution. 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To cleanse us and forgive us. Forgive and cleanse. Forgive, salvation, cleanse, healing. Okay, we need both of them working simultaneously. With that said, I'm not saying that God doesn't care about sin, or God is soft on sin, or your sin is no big deal. God is not some softy in the sky who says, it's okay, I'm not, it's not what I'm saying. God hates sin, but he loves you. And no amount of sin can separate you from the love of God. Again, not my words, words of St. Paul. Anyone who struggles with guilt and shame, you got to memorize these verses and post them someplace prominent. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you know, this is Romans 8. You know Romans 7, the verse we've been talking about several times, was the verse where St. Paul said, Man, I'm the worst person in the world. I don't know what I'm doing. The things which I'm trying to stop, I can't stop. And things which I'm trying to start, I can't. And on the heels of saying, I'm the worst person, I have the worst action, it says nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He hates sin, but he loves you. We will not hide. Number two, <clears throat> we will not let our lapses turn into relapses. What's the difference between a lapse and a relapse? I gotta be honest, I stole this from an article I read one time about dieting. Very spiritual matters. And it was talking about, when you look at it in the terms of dieting, it makes very easy sense. When you go on a diet, okay, 
and you're trying to stop eating ice cream, okay, or fudge sickles or whatever, okay, and you're trying to stop, it is inevitable, it is inevitable, you'll break your diet. It is inevitable that you will at one point in time down a, a half a gallon of ice cream. It's, it's just going to happen. But when it happens, you have a choice. Was that episode a lapse or a relapse? What's the difference? A lapse means, hey, that was a tough night. Let's get back on track. You live to fight another day. A relapse is, oh well, all is lost. I did my best while I had the chance. Bring on the, the Ben and Jerry's. You have a decision to make in your mind, okay? You finished the ice cream, you ate it. Now in your mind, you have a decision to make. It's a will thing. It's not, it's not the ice cream that makes the decision, it's you. Was this night of binging and, 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 and delight that we had, okay, with the ice cream, was this a lapse or was it a relapse? Same thing with sin. <clears throat> you're going to repent, you're going to confess. And again, just a secret. Don't tell anyone. But you're probably going to sin again. Probably. You make a decision. When you fall into that same sin again, was this a lapse or relapse? Many of us throw our hands up and say, I did my best. I gave it a try. I prayed. Did this small group thing. I, I, I fasted. I did everything. I fell. Oh well. Or will we say, I fell off the horse, I'm going to get right back on. And if I fall again, I'm going to get right back on. And if I have a hundred lapses, I will not call it a relapse and give myself the excuse. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, A righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. A righteous man may fall seven times and rise again. That's what we want to be. <clears throat> now, if you want to turn, or if you don't want to allow lapses to become relapses, what's the most important thing that keeps a lapse from becoming a relapse? I'll give you a hint. It's not prayer. It's not fasting. What is it? It's people. It's people. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Two are better than one, for if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Woe to him who is alone when he falls, he has no one to help him up. And how many times we fall, we got no one around us, and we stay stuck down. This is why you need your father of confession. This is why you need to be at church every single Sunday. Because in case you fell, Sunday evening through Saturday evening. You need to get back up on Sunday morning, get back on that horse. This is why you need your small group. This is why you need, even within your small group, uh, uh, someone who can hold you spiritually accountable, who can kick you in the pants when you need to, and say, hey, we're making this commitment together. Let's, let's do this together. And it's okay if you fell. Let's go. Let's get back up. By yourself, you're going to stay down But if you have someone next to you, trust me, it'll be much easier to get back up and keep on going forward. Third thing we're going to do, based on his goodness, I'm going to learn from my mistakes. I'm going to learn from my falls. I'm not going to waste any one of my falls. Every fall, I'm going to learn something about myself, or about my weakness, or about my circumstances, or about my idiot friends. I'm going to learn something. You ever wonder... Why does God make a big deal out of examining yourself? You know why? It's because God just wants us to feel guilty. Like if God just wanted to forgive us, just forgive us. Just kind of, just forgive us. Why make such a big deal out of finding out exactly and examining? Why? Because he wants you to avoid it in the future. Because again, we're not talking about here just life. We're talking about freedom. We're talking about the grave clothes. And yes, he can give you life. But if you want the abundance and fullness of life, you have made poor choices, and that is what has kept you from having that freedom at often times. Or other people make poor choices, and that inhibits your freedom. So what he wants us to do is examine and learn from our falls. King David said, 
<clears throat> in Psalm 32, verse 5. When I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity, I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. What confession does is confession, searching out, examining. What I always think of it myself is like a tube between me and God and God trying to free flow His goodness and His grace and His power into my life. And these things are like little things Okay, which inhibit the flow. Okay, so when I can examine and confess, what it does is it frees God to work more freely in my life. It removes the obstacles. <clears throat> this is very important to those who are especially like, it may feel like you're falling a lot these days. Just the other day, I had someone come to me Good kid. Kid who wasn't close, very close to God his whole life, but started over like the past three, four months getting close to God, repented, left the group of friends, like made serious changes. And this kid came to me and he was crying. I had never seen this kid cry before. He's a happy-go-lucky kind of kid. I, what's wrong, man? And he's, I thought some catastrophe or something. He said, I got all these sins. And he was really sincere. I got all these sins. And it seems like every time I, I solve one, Man, God is just revealing another one. And God is just opening my eyes to another one. And God is showing me another one. And, and I can't keep up. Man, you know what I told the kid? I was like, man, these aren't new sins. You've had them all along. Don't be so depressed. You're not gaining new ones. You're just seeing them for the first time. This is like the kid who's got a messy room. He's got clothes all over the place. And finally he decides, you know what, I'm going to clean my room. And he cleans his room and he notices a stain in the carpet. And he cries because there's a stain in the carpet. Man, the stain's always been there. But it's just you see it for the first time because you started to clean. Is it a bad thing to notice that stain? No. And I told the kid, man, this is great. He said, you know many, how many other people are walking around with the same sins that don't see it, that are smiling right now? He said, you're lucky. I said, there's a lot of other people who have the same fault times ten, but they just don't see it. This is a good thing. When God reveals sins, when you fall, God wants to teach you something from it. What I would say is God never reveals a sin that He is not 110% ready to begin working on. So when God unveils, you got this problem in this area, don't scare, don't be afraid. It's God's way of saying, I'm ready to pour out my power into this area. But you got to see it first. You cannot heal a wound that you haven't first acknowledged its existence. <clears throat> what we're going to do, based on His goodness, based on His goodness, I'm not going to hide. I'm not going to let my lapses turn to relapses. I'm going to learn from every one of my mistakes. But then in the end, I will never, ever, ever stop trusting in God's love. It's dangerous to examine yourself because you're going to find a lot of stuff you didn't like and you didn't know was there. Like I said, you're going to find a lot of stains in the carpet and it's a scary thing. But make no mistake about it. God is trying to shine His power and His freedom in your life but you got to uncover the mess first. You came in here today like I did, full of problems, full of bad stuff. You, like I, came in today doing your best to hide it. That's what we do, and we're all very good at it. But that doesn't negate the fact that it's there. What are you dealing with today that's out of your control? What's enslaving you? What is capturing you, handcuffing you? <clears throat> what stuff is it that you just don't want to deal with in your life? Those things, that particular thing, just as this shining light here is shining bright there on that spot, this light here is a good picture of exactly what God wants to do in your life. When you expose it, it's going to shine a light. And yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable, and it's going to be 
uncomfortable? But make no mistake about it. That's the first step to healing. Remember this verse. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's not as much based on you as you think. It's a lot more based on him than you realize. Once God is in there and he's working and he's shining his light, he will accomplish the job. Today, God is not asking you to make a promise that you can't keep. Blessed are the pure in heart. He's not asking you to make a promise that you can't keep. He's inviting you to receive a promise that only He can keep. That when we examine, when we confess, when we declare we want those pure hearts and we give God a chance, that we will see God and we will find freedom from all the problems and all, this, all the things that's keeping us from the fullness of life. We will find it. Keep in mind this verse. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Our goal for this week is to clean our house. You have a homework assignment. you got seven days. Clean your house. Look under stuff. Go behind stuff. Don't just do the surface level stuff. Go deep. Deep clean. You may have to schedule some time off. You may have to call in sick to work one day for a few hours. You may have to cancel a racquetball game one evening. But we're not, we're not leaving this week. Our house dirty. This week we're going to clean our house. Let's stand for a prayer.